Hello everyone and welcome to Kerbal Space Program episode 9 of SSTO Space Program. Today we will be deploying new communications satellites in style using VTOL SSTOs and also we will be testing new heavy payload cargo SSTO. All of this is needed because we are sending interplanetary missions very soon. Our last epic base building missions kind of ruined our budget and now we need to focus more on contracts that will give us some easy money. Luckily for us, there is a number of interesting contracts available and we will be picking one for geostationary satellite deployment, as we need to do that anyway. Uh, there is also an interesting contract for a new outpost on the moon that we will do, but in a different manner than you'd probably expect. But before we do all that, I wanted to quickly show you this neat little science jet that I use for Kerbin-based contracts. Those contracts give us usually a bit more than 50,000 credits, but get progressively harder and later on often require taking high-altitude readings on the other side of the planet. Well, this plane makes it easy, as it can fly around Kerbin without refueling, even more so if you replace ramjets with Panther engines. The contract we're doing now, however, requires us to perform some low-altitude readings in the Northern Hemisphere quite far away from the KSC. And look! We're almost on the other side of the planet and we have spent only about 30% of our initial fuel. The key to make it fly efficiently is to keep your altitude at 18 to 20 km and your velocity at around 1000 m per second. Here I'm flying a little bit faster because we don't need to be hyper efficient, our target was indeed a bit closer to KC than half the planet. Anyway, it's a neat little science plane that is very useful and fun to fly so be sure to check it out. The link to all the crafts that we will be using today is as usual in the description. Now that we've gained another 55,000 credits, it's time to take care of our comm network. As you remember, I used wrong antennas and the satellites can barely connect to each other. That makes them completely useless for interplanetary connections. I also haven't paid enough attention when putting them into orbit and now they are in complete disarray. We will correct that now and we will do this in style. To deploy our satellites, we will use this VTOL SSTO with 10 ton payload capacity that I made specifically for this purpose, called Agena. The craft you see right now is full stock and I made it specifically for you guys. I will be using one that uses Infernal Robotics, but if you wanted to have a full stock VTOL SSTO, this one is perfectly fine, just a little bit harder to fly. So let's add the satellite and let me explain how this works. Because of the way stock hinges are built here, you start on support. So press abort to detach the wings, now you have two separate vessels. One is the main fuselage and wings are the other one. Switch the wings, rotate them to vertical position and engage brakes to lower the legs. At this point you can switch back to the main body and detach the support, but be sure to have SAS engaged. Now switch back to the wings, engage SAS, throttle up and press 1 to start the engines. And off you go! Once you take off, you can rotate the wings and they should dock back to the main fuselage when close enough. This doesn't always work smoothly, especially in flight, and this is why I decided to stick with the Infernal Robotics in the design I am going to use. This vessel has initial thrust to weight ratio in jet mode of 1.2, which is needed to take off and land vertically. It should have around 1000 meters per second delta V while in orbit and can carry up to 10 tons of cargo. As you can see, it's extremely powerful and maneuverable, which makes it very easy to fly. The only drawback is its limited range, as is the case with all VTOL SSTOs. Getting it into orbit is nevertheless very easy, as we have enough fuel and oxidizer to make it there without any special tricks. Putting anything into a geostationary orbit requires around 1000 meters per second delta V, which is exactly what we have. This means we could go there, but wouldn't have enough fuel for a trip back to Kerbin. Therefore, we'll put our SSTOs in a geostationary transfer orbit, with the apoapsis touching the final orbit we want to be in. This time I made the extra effort and calculated the exact parameters of the orbit we need to be in beforehand. We also want to bring one of the old satellites back to Kerbin, so I set an encounter with it, which is in fact quite similar to setting an encounter with the Moon. To get into a geostationary transfer orbit, we need to execute a 670 meters per second burn using nuclear engines. For Kerbin, this is obviously much less than for Earth. A geostationary transfer orbit is an elliptical orbit as the eagle died among you have noticed already, into which a spacecraft is initially placed before being transferred to a geosynchronous or geostationary orbit. 
For Kerben, the upper abscess is at about 2868 km and the periapsis is just above the atmosphere. For the Earth, the apogee is at 35784 km. Once the apoapsis is reached, the satellite needs to perform a circularization burn, and for Kerbin, this burn is about 400 meters per second, while for the Earth it's 1478 meters per second, assuming zero inclination for the transfer orbit. Our satellite to be recovered has quite a lot of fuel left, so it can easily catch up with the Agena, letting us save quite a lot of fuel. Once we were close to apoapsis, our new satellite was deployed and activated. We will put it into its final orbit a bit later. Right now, our old satellite managed to catch up with the SSTO, but we have a problem. It has no docking port and therefore we need to install one before we can dock it back into the cargo bay. So, Bill Wright Kerman, our engineer for this mission, went out to install a junior docking port on the satellite. This is of course possible thanks to the Kerbal attachment system and in a fully stock game the only way we could grab the satellite back would be using a claw. With the docking port installed I spent some time practicing docking without RCS and eventually managed to dock the satellite into the cargo bay using calculated engine thrusts. With Belrai back on board and the cargo safely secured we were ready to lower our periapsis and prepare for aerobraking. But we are not done here yet. Our new satellite needed to perform a circularization burn first and this time, to be extra sure it's placed correctly, I set the opposite apsis to the exact value that is required for geostationary orbit. I know that you could technically switch to surface velocity and see if it's zero, but I wanted to keep things as realistic as possible. And in reality, you wouldn't have that option. We will deploy a couple more satellites like this one to complete our network. And as a side note, I wanted to say that I based the looks on the Galileo satellites that are an ESA project alternative to GPS. Right now, however, after a couple of aero breaks to adjust the periapsis, Aegina is ready for its final re-entry and landing. As you can see, it's super stable and flies really well. I like this craft quite a lot and I highly recommend you check it out. VTOLs are always a lot of fun to fly. We will be landing it vertically, as it has no other landing gear than the legs attached to the engine nacelles. It's not hard in any way, and even with my poor flying skills, I was able to easily land it on the launch pad, because we want as much money back as possible. And look at it sitting there, with the satellite we recovered safely in the cargo bay. I really like how it looks, kind of like a bird and very organic. I hope you like it too. It was at this point when I realized we were at the transfer window to Moho, something I was completely unprepared for. Interplanetary transfer windows don't happen very often, and even if we're not exactly ready to mount a mission to Moho, I thought it's an opportunity that we can't miss. It's also a good excuse to show you yet another cargo SSTO that I made. But first, we need a spacecraft that would go to Moho. First, I wanted to send an unmanned mission with a large rover, but it turned out to be too expensive. Even if we would eventually recover most of it, the initial price was just too high. Second version was a manned spacecraft with one lucky volunteer, this time however without a lander. It would be a nice opportunity to test the deep freeze mod, but this one was also a little bit too expensive in its recoverable version. Finally, I decided to send just a simple rocket with two scanning satellites. It's cheap, and 80% of the price are the satellites, so I won't be recovering the transfer stage at all. This entire spacecraft will be delivered into orbit by our new heavy payload large volume cargo SSTO called Hyperion. It is yet another design that uses fairings instead of a cargo bay and has a maximum payload capacity of 220 tons into low carbon orbit. I don't think that we will ever need to send more in one piece, so it might be a craft that we will use quite often in the future. Actually, we need to build a supply line between our moon base and Kerbin and for that I thought we would need a space freighter. It would be a vessel that stays in space all the time and could go between Kerbin and Moon, maybe land on the Moon or have dedicated landers to do that. If we needed to expand our base, build a new one or just send some stuff to or from our base in large volume, it would be very useful and helpful. Now, I could build it myself, but I think it would be more fun if you guys helped me out with that. 
You can use all the mods that we have installed for this series and that includes most of the USI mods and stock parts as well as tweak scale. I think freight transportation system could be a great place to start. The only requirements I have is that the part count has to be relatively low, preferably under 300 parts, and this ship should be able to make it to the moon and back to Kerbin at least once when fully loaded. As for maximum payload, let's aim for around 1000 tons, because some of the stuff that we are going to dig and bring back to Kerbin is heavy. You can of course use any of the modded engines from USI or scaled nuclear engines if you like. Back to our current mission, we safely made it into orbit with our Moho rocket. It was much lighter than the maximum payload this vessel can carry, so getting there was easy. Now, after deploying the fairing, our rocket separated and I activated solar panels on the satellites and we were ready to execute the transfer burn to Moho. Getting to Moho is actually pretty tricky and while the theoretical minimum burn required to go there is a bit over 1300 meters per second, our actual burn was almost 1000 meters per second more. We are sending two scanning satellites to MOHO that we will use to map its surface and get all the relevant information about biomes, surface features and anomalies. Once the burn was finished, I set a maneuver node to correct our trajectory, once we will be closer to MOHO, set an alarm using Kerbal alarm clock and all we need to do now is wait. Our rocket left Kerbin and it was time to deorbit the Hyperion and landed back on the runway. The ship, despite its rather strange shape, flies relatively well and it's quite stable. As you can see, I was experimenting a bit with the engine layout and long slim intakes that you can see around the central ramjet. It created a cool looking effect and allowed putting 8 rapier engines instead of the usual 6 around it. Anyway, we landed on the runway without much trouble and we were ready for our next assignment. So, back to the satellite deployment. The first satellite we deployed today was just a test, but now comes the real contract we will be paid for. Again, using our new Agena VTOL SSTL, we will be putting a communication satellite in geostationary orbit. This time, not only we need to add some extra science instruments to it, but what is more important and probably more difficult to achieve is that we need to place our satellite over a specific spot on Kerbin's surface. It is a really cool contract I wanted to do for a long time, as it feels surprisingly realistic. I also have no idea how to do it in a reliable manner in stock game, apart from trial and error. But we are lucky enough to have Scansat installed. As you can see, I've already finished mapping Kerbin's surface and we can see our vessel's orbit on the big map here. It also works for any maneuver node we create, so the only thing we have to do is create a maneuver node for geostationary orbit transfer and move it around until Apoapsis lines up with the contract waypoint and execute it. I just love how this one simple feature transformed this contract from something that would be probably pretty difficult or rather tedious to achieve into something extremely simple. You probably have heard me praising Scansat before, but let me say it again. It's a great and very much needed mod, I can't imagine playing without it. We executed our burn and again placed Agena in a geostationary transfer orbit. This time we won't be catching any of the old satellites, so we have a little bit more time to enjoy the view of Kerbin as we are getting into a high orbit around it. When we were almost at the apoapsis, the satellite was deployed and activated. The only difference was that this time I had to pay special attention to execute circularization burn in such a way that our satellite would remain over the spot we needed it to be. And bear in mind that we were moving at over 400 meters per second in reference to the surface. Nevertheless, we managed to do that and yet another satellite of our Amerigo Com network was successfully placed in orbit overlooking Kraken's arch. It is also important to mention that we cashed in over 220,000 credits for doing this. As our SSTO was coming down for aerobraking, the Moho rocket we sent earlier left Kerbin's sphere of influence and since it was the first time I sent a vessel into a solar orbit, we got another plus 70,000 credits as a reward. If we keep getting money at this pace, we will be building colonies and outposts everywhere in the Kerbal system, hopefully. After landing the Agena, there was one last contract I wanted to do. As you remember, we had a contract that required building a new Munar outpost that could hold 17 Kerbals. That's quite a lot, and we don't really need a new outpost. What we need is to expand the one we already have. 
Also, building a useful MKS base for 17 kerbals would cost more than we are going to be paid, so I decided to do something different instead. We are going to build a passenger version of our Artemis SSTO that could carry the required number of kerbals and have all of the other required components, and we will send it to the moon. Once we land, it will count as an outpost and we are going to get paid for it. But instead of leaving it there, our SSTO will simply take off and go back to Kerbin, allowing us to recover its full price. It might feel like an exploit, but let's think about it as a very temporary mobile outpost. We weren't asked to stay on the moon, just to land there, so I guess it's okay. Once Artemis took off, a new rescue mission was available. We had a stranded Kerbal in Kerbin's orbit, which is great. Maybe not for the poor guy, but for us for sure, because we are getting not only a free Kerbal, we are getting paid for getting a Kerbal. Since we didn't take off to ensure a rendezvous, and I didn't want to wait for an encounter while in the orbit around Kerbin, I decided that we will catch our Kerbal mid-burn on our way to the moon. In principle, it's pretty easy. We start our burn to have a Moonar encounter, but we stop it once we get an encounter with the stranded vessel. If we do it properly, we should have a very close flyby and our Kerbal can EVA out and hopefully catch up with Artemis. In reality, Kerbals on EVA have around 500 meters per second delta V, and our relative velocity was around 300 meters per second. Also, you can EVA out a stranded Kerbal only when you get within 2.1 km range. That leaves us with very little time to react and catch up with the passing vessel. As you might expect, it didn't go as smoothly as I wanted and I had to use Artemis engines to catch up with our stranded Kerbal after it got out and was chasing our SSTO. Once Deslan Kerman was safe in the cockpit, we finished our moon transfer burn and placed our vessel in a correct trajectory for a Moonar encounter. The extra burn we just did is not too important, as Artemis has 1000 meters per second delta V extra for a trip to the moon, and we can allow such extra burns without endangering our mission. Once we got to the moon, we had to execute an insertion burn, as usual, but this time, instead of entering a circular orbit, our vessel was placed in an eccentric orbit around the moon, with apoapsis between 160 and 170 kilometers. This is simply because we had yet another contract that required testing a spark engine at this altitude on a suborbital trajectory. So, after a tiny deorbit burn at the apoapsis, the engine was tested and we were free to adjust our orbit for a proper landing. This time we are not doing any science, as I think all the biomes around the equator have already been sampled. We are not delivering anything to our outpost and therefore we are free to choose any landing location. Since it did not matter, I decided to land somewhere in the Munar Midlands and after deorbiting our SSTO, most of the braking was done on nuclear engines. As you guys are all experts now in flying SSTOs, I won't go into details how it should be done, but what is great about Artemis, and it's worth underlining, is that it has a lot of excess oxidizer, and while it limits its range, it does significantly help with powered landings and takeoffs, tremendously increasing engine efficiency. As you can see, after a brief break on the moon's surface, we went back into orbit and were getting ready for a trip back to Kerbin. Again, Artemis has excess fuel, and I think we have done enough man missions recently that we don't need to go over the details how it was done. So instead, let me just briefly sum up that we have earned almost 1 million credits today and significantly repaired our budget. This means we are ready to do more interesting stuff next time. So I need you guys to build the freighter we talked about earlier. I will use Hyperion and other SSTOs to assemble your massive creation in orbit and once it's done, we will send it for its maiden flight to the moon, delivering an equally impressive mining outpost. So thank you very much for watching, I hope that you've enjoyed watching this video and uh, if you did, please consider liking it and if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below, I'll try to answer them the best I can. I'm Mark Frim and I'll see you next time, cheers!